So this is a, or was, a Wearcliffe bulk eraser. Uh, it's used for erasing magnetic media. This one is designed for recording tape, you know, reel-to-reel -reel tape, uh, up to 8-inch reels. Um, it used to be twice the height of this, and it had a, a flap at the front, um, well, an aperture, a rectangular aperture, and you slid the tape in. Um, uh, you pushed up against a couple of springs so that then once the tape's erased, which happens almost instantaneously, the springs then push it back out into your hand. Um, the problem with it was that I use a lot of ten and a half inch tapes and it, the, you know, you can't use it with ten and a half inch tapes. And I've been keeping my eye out on eBay for a, ten, a machine that would erase ten and a half. Uh, but they're very expensive and, uh, you know, 250 quid or something. Been looking for a cheap one for ages and just not seen it. So I thought I would butcher this one to make it into something that's uh, universal. So basically now, um, by removing this mechanism where you slid the tape in, we just got direct access to the electromagnet. Because that's all these things are. They're a big AC electromagnet. And that's how they erase um, the contents of a tape. And they're particularly useful for reel-to-reel -reel if you use both two and four track uh, machines. Because, you know, the, the fact that the tracks are not the same size and don't align exactly with each other means that a tape that was recorded on a four track, you go to use it on a two track and the erase head can't quite erase everything off um, because the tracks aren't aligned. It's also obviously a very quick way of erasing something. You literally just wave your magnetic medium over it. You know, you could do, do, do the same with a floppy disk or be interesting. I might try hard drive. Next time I've got an old one that's failing, just stick it on there and give it a quick buzz and then stick it back in a computer and see whether you can read any of the data off it. I bet you can't because it's an impressive field strength. So, um, how does it work? Basically, uh, well, I'll take the front panel off and show you a little bit of the inner workings. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give you a good view of the coil because what I should have done really is photograph this as I was building it. Um, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll talk through the, the innards uh, in a short while. But all they are is basically half of a transformer. So in a transformer, you have an iron core, laminated iron core, uh, and in this thing, it's there's a hugely heavy core. It's over 10 kilos, um, 12, 13 maybe. And in a transformer, you have basically it provides you electrical isolation. So you put AC power in one side, you get AC power out the other, but they are electrically isolated because you're effectively converting electricity to magnetism and then back to electricity again. The other thing that they're commonly used for is changing voltage because the ratio of number of turns between the primary and secondary coil, primary is where the mains is going in, mains in our case, but AC going in, and then secondary is where AC is generated and coming out. And so if you have, say, twice as many turns on the secondary as you do on the primary, then the voltage is double the primary on the secondary, but the current is halved. And if you have half as many turns on the secondary as the primary, then the voltage is half and the current is double. So before switch mode power supplies, transformers were, uh, you know, used in all kinds of um, de devices around the home that needed need low voltage DC out. And that's why power packs used to be so much heavier because they had a transformer in them. And then, of course, in the last 15, 20 years, switch mode power supplies have become far more common and they're much lighter because the transformer in them is, is way smaller um, because they're switching at high frequency. So you can have a much smaller core. Anyway, going off topic. So this little puppy uh, is basically a big yoke from a transformer, but only a primary coil. In fact, there is, that's not quite true, there is a secondary coil, but it's it's wrapped on the same side as the primary uh, and it's only a few turns and it's just used for powering low voltage indicators. In fact, I'm using it to power the red light, red lamp you can see in the middle of the screen there um, to tell us when it's on. 
Um, but the other side of the yoke that you'd normally see the secondary arm has got nothing. So this is just a big electromagnet. And because the AC mains power going in is alternating direction, uh, the magnetic field that is generated is also changing direction. It's going from north to south, north to south, 50 times a second with the, the mains frequency. So I'll just switch it on and show you a couple of demos um hang on a sec all right so on lights all dim they really do a little bit um not sure that's sharp on the on the film so this is obviously just a big adjustable spanner so i can feel that vibrating in my hand um from this distance as i go to here it's actually hard to hold it let me put this bit of um cardboard to protect the surface all right okay I'm going to hold this. I mean, I'm not holding the best angle because I'm, my arm's oh, turn off because my arm's horizontal. But I'm going to see how low I can get it before it gets pulled out of my. <sighs> yeah, it's uh, really quite a strong electromagnet. Um, Aluminium's interesting on electromagnets. Uh, actually, maybe I'll keep that bit of card. This is uh, this square's aluminium. So the magnetic field repels the aluminium here. That's floating. I'll turn it on again. That's floating there. I mean, I can't let go because it will just get pushed off the, the area where the field's strongest. But genuinely, I'm not, not trying to hold that up. See, look, as I move it down, see, at that point there, it's at highest. So why does aluminium react with an electromagnet? Because aluminium react to it. Aluminium uh, with a permanent magnet, you know, like a little bar magnet or a neodymium magnet, there's no attraction at all. With an electromagnet there is a repulsion and let me remember how this works. So because the magnetic field is changing, because it's constantly changing direction with the AC um, mains, um, in a changing magnetic field a conductor uh, generates a current or rather a current is generated in a conductor that's in a moving magnetic field and so a current is actually generated within the lump of aluminium I believe it's an eddy current and um, that current then creates a magnetic field which repels the electromagnet so that's why the aluminium is pushed away from the electromagnet now what I'm not sure about is why is it pushed away rather than attracted you know it it's obviously, yeah, because the magnetic field of the coil is constantly changing. So presumably also the eddy currents constantly changing direction in the lump of aluminium and it always repels. But why does it repel, not attract? Is that Fleming's left-hand rule, right-hand rule? I don't remember. It's a long time since I did A-level physics. Um, what I'm a little bit disappointed about, though, is um, with big electromagnets, you can... Um, launch aluminium discs um, using that same effect and I've got some hard disk drive platters let's just get one out here and it just doesn't do that it just goes like that why is it not flying off at great speed which is a great shame um, yeah just a quick note about um, power, power factor so you know, power factor is a, a, a measure of how much the current lags the voltage in, in an inductive load. And, you know, a good power factor, you know, a good quality, say, switch mode power supply might be 80%, 90%, whatever. Um, this thing, I measured the current, it's 15 amps, which is actually a little bit over the 13 amp mains plug that's, that's, uh, it's connected via. Uh, but of course, a fuse doesn't blow as soon as you go over its rating. Uh, you know, it blows pretty quickly if you double the rating. If you put twenty six amps through a thirteen amp fuse, but if you uh, if you're just a little bit over, it just gets warm, and I guess it might blow eventually. So um, yeah, fifteen amps and at about two hundred and sixty watts, which means its power factor is point one or thereabouts, uh, which is shockingly bad. I've never seen anything with such a low power factor. Um, so anyway, I'm just gonna pause and then uh, just remove the front panel and 
show you the innards. Oh, just before I do, so I didn't see what temperature we started at, 20 something though. That there is a cheap um, temperature probe and uh, I've stuck the probe end onto the primary coil just with a bit of glue. Uh, just because it gets so hot so quickly, I think, you know, you could only use it for a couple of minutes before giving it a 10 minute break, something of that order, um, without risk of, you know, damaging the lacquer on the primary coil. So anyway, I shall pause and remove the front panel. So, um, at the back, you can see the yellow... Uh, tape that's wrapping the primary coil um, unfortunately I can't take this black top off easily it's a one and a half mil vinyl sheet because uh, I've glued it onto the top of the iron yoke it, you know I wanted to get it as close as possible and I didn't want to drill into the yoke because it's laminated I thought I could cause problems so I just used contact adhesive so I mean it, I could take it off but I'm not going to take it off just for the sake of um, this video so there's this massive coil that takes 15 amps uh, at 240 volts. And then over here is a large relay, large capacity, so it's 30 amps, 3.0. And, you know, because it's such an inductive load, the power factor is so poor, when you disconnect it, there's a big arc. And... So I'm switching both the live and the neutral in the hope that you're kind of spreading the load of, of disconnecting and perhaps then the size of the arc is less on each individual set of contacts. I don't know. Not sure. Anyway, I thought, what have I got to lose? I might as well. Um, so then the other thing we've got is this little cheap uh, timer unit I got from one of the Chinese import sites. So... You put mains in on the green terminal on the bottom left and then the blue terminal just about above it is the output of the little blue relay and so it's got a normally closed and a normally open contact the normally closed contact is powering the there's a little yeah, orange neon indicator on the front just to tell you it's plugged in and then the normally open contact powers the larger relay um, so it's quite a nice little timer unit. It's a shame it's got a capacitive, capacitive, Jesus, uh, capacitive drop. Oh my God, it's pathetic. Anyway, it's got a capacitor used to lower the voltage, uh, the mains voltage for the, to power the circuitry, the electronics, which is, yeah, it's just one of those things. It's a cheap way of doing it. Um, and I apparently can't pronounce the word. So, yeah, there's a potentiometer just next to the LED display there. Um, and that's where you adjust the amount of time and it displays as you turn the knob. Um, so this is set to 30 seconds. So it'll power on for 30 seconds unless you press the switch again, in which case it powers off immediately. Um, it, this particular timer does minutes as well. There's basic, there's a little jumper. Yeah, just over this side, this side here. There's my finger there. Uh, and that you use to set between seconds and minutes. Sorry, my camera work is frankly appalling, but there you go. So if I hit the switch now from the other side, you see that starts counting down. And alarming buzzing noises come from the electromagnet. I'm just gonna turn it straight off now. So there you go, the butchered Weircliff bulk eraser. It is a little bit of a shame that I've, you know, taken a nice old thing like that that's relatively rare and butchered it. But the way I look at it is, at least now it, it does what I need it to do. I can erase 10 and a half inch tapes with it. And I have done, tested it, and yeah, one very quick pass. So what I do is put the tape, if you imagine the centre of the tape around here, so it's going like that, and just give it one full turn is, is enough. You don't need to turn it over. I did an experiment, one side alone is enough um the only thing i perhaps need to experiment more with is problem with bulk erasers is you know well for a start you don't turn it off with the tape on it you gradually move the tape away a bit like when you're using a tape head demagnetizer if you've ever used one of those what you're supposed to do is gradually move it away because you don't want to leave a single you know a, either a north or a south 
magnetization on the thing you're trying to demagnetize. So as you move it slowly away, you're putting it on the smallest amount of field that you can. Um, so because I always have to turn the tape, I'm not quite sure how to do that. I want to basically spiral it off. So do a whole turn with it on there and then gradually turn it and move it higher and higher. I don't know, maybe I'll do some experimentation. Right, that's probably more than enough rambling, so I shall stop.